In chapters two and three so far, we've had to deal with single data sets or sometimes frequency distributions, which is a data set that's been compiled into a table. But what happens if you have two variables that relate to each other, like an explanatory and a response variable, say from section 1.2 that we just covered? Well, then there's a whole nother gamut of relationships that are going on. There's the relationships between those two variables and how that plays out in some kind of linear model. So we're going to start in section 4.1, which is scatter diagrams, which are graphs of those um, paired up data, and then the correlation of those data. And then we will look at how to model those relationships later on in this, in this chapter. So let's start with a scatter diagram, also known as a scatter plot. It's a graphic tool that's used to display the relationship between two quantitative variables. So it's very important to know that in chapter four, you're trying to look at an explanatory variable and a response variable. The explanatory variable we will place on the x-axis because it's sort of like your independent variable from algebra, not quite the same, but close enough. And then the response variable on the y-axis. So we have the following scatter plot shows the relationship between the number of children per woman in a country and that country's average life expectancy in 1962. So the table shows a few of the countries in the data set. So obviously not all the countries are here. There's you know, a couple hundred countries in the world and I only included you know, five in this table. So the rest of them are not here, but you can see them all in this graph here. See, so the explanatory variable is the fertility rate. That's the number of births per woman and the life expectancy is the response variable. And then again, this is 1962. So what would be the predictor variable? Predictor, remember, is another word for explanatory variable. Again, that was discussed oh, back here, I think. Yeah, explanatory variable, AKA predictor variable, same thing. So um, that would be the fertility rate. So that would be births per woman. There we go, I got that in there. And then the response variable would be life expectancy. Expectancy, I can spell. All right, now I want to interpret the meaning of the U.S.'s values from 1962. So the U.S. in 1962 is right here. Those were the values. So now what do those mean? Well, they mean that in the U.S. in 1962, women had about an average of 3.378 children. Um, and then the life expectancy of people that were, a, a baby that was born in 1962 had a life expectancy of 70.21 years. So let me type that up one second. Okay, so in 1962, women were having about an average, or I should say women in the U.S., women in the U.S. were having an average of about 3.378 children in their lifetime. Furthermore, a baby born in the U.S. in 1962 was expected to live about 70.21 years. All right, so now that we understand how both of those variables work and how to interpret them, let's look at the Middle Eastern country of Yemen had a birth rate of 8.37 births per woman, Yowch. and a life expectancy of 35 years in 1962. Circle and label Yemen on the graph. Okay, so let me circle and label Yemen. Now realize 8.37 is the highest, right? It's, it's very large, it's over here. So it's that dot right there. I'll be right back with that circled and labeled. One second. There we go, got Yemen right there, circled and labeled. All right, so now that we know that, that's all they're doing there. So it's just, this is just a question of, do you know how to read a graph or something like this? So being over 8.3 would be right here and then up 35 or 32 or whatever it was. All right, we're all set there. So what type of variable is fertility rate? Now fertility rate is the number of births per woman, right? But remember, it's an average. It's not exactly like we know that a woman can't have 3.378 children per woman. We know that. But what we're doing is we're averaging it out for all these different countries, which means that it's going to have tons of decimal places. It means that it's this. All right. Because since it's going to have uncountable number of decimal places, you know, technically, if you just have more fine tuned data sets you could get lots and lots you know 3.37824465 children per woman now grant you it would probably end at some point because it's got to be a certain proportion but it's close enough for our purposes it has a lot of decimal places we're going to call it continuous if anybody wants to argue with me about that feel free because i i don't disagree but we're going to go with continuous there because it has lots of decimals and for our purposes having lots of decimals is going to be continuous 
Now, what level of measurement is the variable fertility rate? I would argue that it is ratio. Because if it's quantitative, it's either interval or ratio most of the 99.9% .9 of the time. And then interval means you can have negatives. Well, you can't have negative fertility rates, so that's out. All right, now what relationship do we see between the variables? You see a negative relationship. Do you see how it kind of starts low for the fertility rate and high for life expectancy? And then as we increase the fertility rate, when, as women having more and more and more children in these countries, then the life expectancy goes down. Right, so that would be a negative relationship. Let me get that right here. Okay, so now in 1962, that's where the terms, that was the year that the terms first world and third world were coined. Um, for, I believe it was an ambassador to the UN. So he was talking about the first world and the third world. So you can kind of see the two groups if you look carefully. Over here is the first world. Um, countries like the U.S. and Great Britain and um, Spain and Portugal and those countries, they have low life or low fertility rates but high life expectancy. Sweden, Germany, etc. And then over here is the third world, right? So a country like Yemen was in the third world in that time frame. So it has a very high life expectancy and a very, or excuse me, very high fertility rate and a very low life expectancy from 1962. All right, so that would mean that first world was kind of long lives. They, they would live a long time, but they had small families. And the third world had big families, right? Like Yemen had big families, but they didn't live very long. And if you're interested in how this has changed over time, I can show you because it is no longer the way it was in that graph. Let me bring this up. All right, here is Gapminder, which is a fabulous, fabulous website that has all sorts of data from all sorts of governments and, and countries around the world. And right now it's showing 1950. And you can see the US where that yellow dot right there, um, in case you're interested, this big red dot here is China. That's India right there, the second most populous country in the world. So on there's Russia right there, Germany, United Kingdom, etc. So let me just play for you a little bit or slow down. Let me go back to 1962. There we go. So there's 1962, which is the graph that you're looking at when you look at the notes. Um, the difference is that this particular graph is a bubble graph, and so they don't, um, they actually have the differences in the populations for the size of dot. So you can see China has the largest population, that's why it has the biggest dot, things like that. So there's 1962. Here's the first world up here, here's the third world. And then I'm going to press play, and I'm going to let you see how it changes over time. There, it's 1990s. Look at how much it's going. There's the 2000s. And notice all these countries are kind of clumping up here. And there is still a first world and a third world, but the third world has far fewer countries in it than it used to. Um, and unfortunately, um, it involves, to a great extent, sub-Saharan Africa, which still has many um, residual problems um, both culturally and monetarily and for various reasons, some of which are no fault of their own. Um, but this is still an area that has pretty high life, um, children per woman and pretty low life expectancy. But a lot of these other countries are right there with us now, right? The U.S., in case you're interested in 2012, was at 1.9 children per woman and 79. You can see it down at the bottom when I let my mouse hover on the United States. And you can also see the population in the bottom right corner. It says 316 million. Fascinating, huh? So, of course, the danger is if, if the world no longer is the way we think about it. If we talk about the third world as if it is what it was back in 1960 and it's no longer that way, that can be a dangerous thing, right, for our government and for ourselves. All right, so let's move here. All right, so we just saw a negative relationship, right, a negative linear relationship. That means that it's forming kind of a line and it starts off high and then goes towards the low end. That's called also called an inverse relationship. Another relationship would be a positive relationship. So um, also called, known as a direct relationship. When one increases, the other increases. For example, your study time and your exam time, your exam score. So as you study for your exam more, your exam scores go up generally. 
Now, it's not 100% true of everybody, but it's a general trend. And that's what we're really talking about here. We're not talking about this is true for everybody. What we're talking about is, is this is the general trend that things follow. So generally, more children means lower life expectancy. It's almost like counterintuitive. All right. Then there are a couple nonlinear relationships. There are relationships, completely strong relationships, but they're not linear. This is a quadratic relationship right here. It kind of forms a parabola shape. And this is an exponential relationship where it forms this kind of curve, kind of. And again, those are great relationships to study, but we don't study them in our course. Our course is primarily considered, matter of fact, only considered with linear relationships. Those are the ones that matter to us at this basic stage. Of course, the next stats course beyond this would be interested in much more complicated relationships and linear and ex or quadratic and exponential among them. But what you don't want to get confused is a nonlinear relationship, which means it has a relation, it just isn't linear, with a no correlation relationship, like this one, where it looks like somebody just kind of threw the points up there. Right? That means that there is no relationship, right? The x and the y did not have a correlation. They are very different from each other, right? Nonlinear relationships have patterns. They just not they're not lines. No relation means they have no pattern at all. It just looks like somebody vomited the points up on the page. All right. So then, if if we care about linear relationships, and we do, it's these two that we care about the most. Those are the ones that matter to us in this course, right? And if that's the case, matter of fact, I'll highlight them. So you can see, right? Those are the ones that matter. So then we're going to dissect that a little bit more and start talking about the strength and the direction. So we want to know positive, negative, great. But we also want to know how strong is it? Is it perfect? Is it moderate? Is it weak? What kind of relationship do we have here? So direction and strength. So let's see here. Let me fill in some of these. These two at the top are kind of obvious. This is a perfect negative. You can tell it's negative because it's going down like that, right? And then this one over here is a perfect positive. Now they're perfect because the dots all form into a perfect line, right? The ducks are all in a row, if you will, right? No stragglers on either side of that line. Those are perfect relationships. Of course, in statistics, we almost never get perfect relationships. It happens in algebra all the time, but in statistics, not so much. All right, so let me scroll down here and I'm gonna fill out some of these. All right, so for the second group, I would argue this is pretty strong over here on the left. This is a strong negative relationship. So I called that one strong because you can really see the line there. This one over here on the right, it's a judgment call. I'm looking at it and I'm kind of seeing mm, it could be moderate, could be strong, but definitely positive, right? So it starts low and ends up high, right? So it's definitely positive, but whether it's moderate or strong, nah, that's a little bit touchy. Um, down here, we have no relation at all on this left one. That's just terrible. I mean, it could be a weak negative, maybe. Or weak, yeah, maybe maybe a weak negative. Very weak. Very weak negative. I would argue there's really no relationship there. And this is a weak positive. That one's definitely got a little bit of a kind of going upside. It starts low here and ends up high here, but it's very weak, right? And this gets us statisticians kind of upset. We don't like the whole just kind of looking at it and guessing. I don't want to guess. I want to have a number that will measure how strong relationships are and then I no longer have to guess. There you go. I typed that up. So mathematicians want a number, statisticians want a number that will tell us what's going on here. I don't want to guess, right? We don't want to guess. We want to, of course, we will still be guessing, but, but we don't want to guess just by looking. We want a number that will give it to us. And that is what the correlation coefficient is. Oops. Is that number. Oops, let me type that up. There we go. That correlation coefficient, which I'm going to talk about in the next video, and its symbol is r, little, little r, is that number for us. That is the number that's going to tell us, is it moderate, is it strong, what is it? Well, it won't tell us quite that definitively, but it'll at least give us a good, strong head start to figuring that stuff out. And we'll talk about that more next time.